At seven, Gary was kind of quiet, and he was a good listener. Even at that age, he was real polite. If you got into trouble, he'd come back to help you out. The Executioner's Song, written by Norman Mailer and published by Little Brown in 1979, like Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, discussed in an earlier installment of Reading America, is Mailer's true life novel. The story, which Mailer weaves, concerns the life and events leading up to the execution of convicted murderer Gary Gilmore on January 17, 1977, an event that ended a decade-long cessation of capital punishment in America. While based on true life, the book is less a work of nonfiction than a novel in which everything that happens happens to be true. In other words, while factual, Mailer adopts a highly symbolic thematic style. Gary Gilmore, the novel's protagonist, a tragic Mailer-esque anti-hero, might in fact be argued to represent the extreme of a national mythology, the American dream of unbridled individualism. In addition to its theme, another clue to the novel-esque quality of this book might be found in its form. Rather than presenting the story through the eyes of Gilmore, his attorneys, or even the author, Mailer chooses to adopt an omniscient point of view. It is an odd choice, for while offering the potentiality to explore characters internally as well as externally, Frank, as Frank McConnell points out in The New Republic, Mailer limits the reader's experience of Gilmore by only allowing him to be understood through the eyes of others. If you've ever seen the similarly told politically driven narrative Citizen Kane by fellow auteur Orson Welles, you have an idea of the aura the execution song exudes. The characters, whose impressions were transcribed by Mailer from tape-recorded interviews, speak in their own voices, while Mailer and his protagonist blend into the background, much like Charles Foster Kane, who was portrayed by Wells, an invisible orchestrator, and he to whom the events inevitably happen. Many critics have rooted Mailer's secret, have noted Mailer's secreted role. Passive at times, partly critical, and partly sympathetic. The author neither condemns nor exonerates Gilmore in his battle with the whole liberal establishment for the right to choose his own death in prison. The decision to em empathize or abominate Gary, to read him as either an emblem of American virtue or a violent punk, is left up to the reader to decide. Mather admits that at one time he considered titling his magnum opus American Virtue. In one interview, he states that the executioner's song was indeed an attempt to explain America. Symptomatic of this desire, he divides his book into warring factions, East versus West, so as to represent the divisiveness inherent to American culture itself. Through this structural choice, D Joan Didion argues, Mailer, Mailer captures two critical crucial features of this country. Gilmore, it might be suggested, lives in the crack of a deep American contradiction. To one side, the West, lies emptiness. To the other, the East, lies estrangement. In the opening section, Western Voices, Mailer expresses the pervasive nihilistic desolation at the center of the Western experience, as the characters indeed seem to drift within an overwhelming tension that drives them toward inevitable negative consequences that lie beyond their control. In Western Voices, we focus on Gilmore in Utah, the state where he was born, spent his earliest years, and following his release from prison, where he followed a road to his ultimate destruction. As we journey with G Gary on this inevitable path, we come to realize that it is no wonder that Gilmore had difficulty in adapting to life outside the prison. Even though supported at first by his cousin Brenda, a strict Mormon who orchestrates his release, 
and then his girlfriend, Nicole, who tries to love him into wholeness, Gary never seems to fit in. Prison, Gary admits to Brenda, is like another planet, a planet in which he has spent the majority of his life. Unaware of how to behave in social situations, he reacts with unease and compulsive violence to any obstacle he encounters, much as he did on the inside. Following his incarceration in Eastern Voices, the concluding half of the Executioner's Song, Mailer turns to the exploitation of Gary's story by the New York media. In making this leap, Mailer seems to lose some of his earlier empathy for this character, like the press satirically painting him more as a recidivist villain than an anti-hero. What drives Gilmore in this section, and what likewise forms the basis for any sympathy that Miller might adopt towards this character, is his capacity to grow, a trait common to all Mailer-esque heroes. Gilmore, in Eastern Voices, is portrayed as a modern man embedded, embedded in a place which has become synonymous with modernity, New York City. It is here that Gilmore searches for his soul. However, because we never see him from within, where his lost soul once resided, we, like society, are forced to judge him based upon what he says and what he does. And as outsiders, we are not able to fully fathom the complexity of Gary or the reasons behind his crimes. Thus, Gilmore remains an impenetrable mystery from beginning to end. The only clue to Mailer's empathy for Gilmore comes from a comment that the author made whereby he admits that Gary appealed to him because of his embodying many of the traits common to Mailer's own life and struggle. Like Gary, Mailer suggests, I used to hate America for what it was doing to all of us. Now, I hate all of us for what we are doing to America. Norman Mailer himself was born in New Jersey in January of 1923, and after graduating from Harvard, served in the U.S. Army from 1944 to 1946. While at war and after, Mailer became obsessed with writing both fiction and journalism, whose combined styles formed the basis for his work stylistically. His first novel, The Naked and the Dead, was published to immediate critical acclaim in 1948 and has been hailed by Anthony Burgess as the best war novel to emerge from the United States. The Executioner's Song, first published in 1979, represents in some ways the author's critical comeback, netting Mailer his second Pulitzer Prize in 1980, as well as the National Book Award. But why not decide for yourself by checking out the Executioner's Song from the newly opened and newly refurbished American Library today?